Christ to our worship here on this uh, beautiful morning. Beautiful morning. As uh, fall comes in this week, about 3 o'clock, I think, in the afternoon of uh, Wednesday, the autumn season opens up to us. <laughs> it's an interesting time. Um, the schools are open, but with a kind of a different flavor this year um, because of the various kind of precautions that people take um, in, as regard to the uh, COVID. Uh, long lines of cars uh, outside the uh, elementary school when it closes uh, for parents who want to pick up their children rather than ask them to ride the bus. However, some are still riding the bus. And it gives, it gave me just a wonderful picture that I want to share with you. I was out riding my bike and I forgot about school opening and that means buses are going to be on the road and getting in my way um, <laughs> if I ride at around 4 o'clock. Uh, but I was out anyway. And I was following this particular school bus down the road, uh, kind of a country road. And what happens is at the end of the lanes where children are let out, there are frequently cars with moms, or more often grandmoms, I think, waiting to receive those uh, students. And uh, various things happen. But on this particular moment, what happened was is that the school bus um, opened this door. It takes forever for these kids to get off the bus. I don't know why they can't just instantly get off the bus and get out of my way. But no, it takes them forever. And so the last kid gets off the bus. Uh, a, a, a mom, I think maybe really a grandma, gets out the car uh, to meet this young fellow, probably about this high, eight or nine years old, ten maybe. And um, I see them both stop, <clears throat> and the little boy starts talking. And the more he talks, the brighter mom gets, uh, or grandma, until finally she just goes like this. Whoa! <laughs> and he runs to her, and they embrace. And I thought, is that not the way to be welcomed home from school? Yeah? And then I thought I was seeing acted out right before my very eyes this picture here. Yeah? Where we're welcome home, right? Welcome home. And I just want to say to us this morning, I believe that if in our mind's eye, if in our face eye, we can see God this morning as we gather here, it's God going like this. It is so good to see you. I don't know what kind of good news that little boy had to tell to his grandma, but it's us coming and saying, God, it sure is good to be home and to be with the folks that shared his home with us. And God says, welcome. It's our theme for this morning, welcoming and serving. And I thank that grandma and that little boy for just showing us so well what that looks like. May God be with us as we worship today. Greet then our liturgists for the morning. And Peggy, it's really good to have you as our uh, liturgist and to share with us now the announcements of the day. Well, yesterday marked the end of our 
flea market season. Um, it was a glorious day. We had, I believe, 12 vendors. And um, you, as you know, we sell small snacks in the kitchen, and we made about $8 for that. Um, but the thrift shop made $414 yesterday. within us 
and give us your love, your peace, and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn uh, introduces the welcoming and serving nature of our Lord. And I invite us to stand and sing the first three verses of Yesu, Yesu.
of our confession and thought it may be a suitable introduction to our time of confession today. Can we see that now? For loving, For loving things we should hate and hating things we should love, God forgive us. For speaking when we should stay silent and staying silent when we should speak, God forgive us. For closing our eyes to injustice and opening them to impurity, God forgive us. For putting you in second place and giving you second best and second guessing your promises to us, God forgive us. So here we stand, guilty and exposed, crying out for mercy, God forgive us. Death was once the end of our story, but now it's just the beginning. You take what is broken and make it beautiful. You take what is hopeless and make it whole. You take what is stained and make it spotless. Because of you, we have a new king, a new heart, and a new life. A new status, a new power, and a new purpose. A new home, a new family, and a new future. The greatest part of our story is not what we gave up for you, but what you gave up for us. The grave is empty, the throne is occupied, and the King is coming back. So God, forgive us. Let us join our hearts for a moment of solid prayer. Join me in our unison prayer. Most loving God, we admit that the scope of our forgiveness is hard for us to comprehend. Your amazing care for us is truly precious for us to consider. Yet we must also confess that all we close ourselves off from your saving presence and in our pride, we withhold our own forgiveness from other people. Now we turn our hearts to you to ask that the power of our Holy Spirit grant us the refreshing assurance of your love. May our hearts be filled with gratitude for your grace, which will overflow with love toward us.
music, how good it is to be touched by God. rejoicing in, I'm quite sure, and in our life together as a congregation and in our individual lives. So we give our thanks, um, and there is much also for which we would beseech the presence of God to bring strength, comfort, and healing into the lives of ourselves and others. So what are our prayers for this morning? What is that for which we would give thanks? What are those things that we ask the Lord to help? Um, first, I had my older brother Stan was in the hospital with a UTI. Um, he also has MS, so recovery for him is you know difficult. But he is home from the hospital. But as he went home, my older sister Claire went in, so now she's there being cared for because I was with the So anyway, I told him it was like a big tennis match. One goes in, one comes out. <laughs> Uh, the ball is in, uh, in my Claire's court right, right. now. But we we pray hope for all be well with Stan as well. Right. Amen. Amen. Uh, others? Yes, Susan? Uh, just, uh, uh, last Susan? Last one said, this Friday, my husband and I will be here in 33 years. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we rejoice in that. Happy anniversary on Friday. Oh, also on Friday, um, our nephew, uh, Kaya, will be celebrating his 35th birthday. Sure. Same ballpark. And uh, all big plans, big plans. Amen. Amen. Gloria? I did celebrate my 86th birthday this year, even though in January um, the doctor gave me a different report, but I, the Lord and I, we came through and I did celebrate my 86th birthday. Mm. 86th birthday. Open to you and 
that we will always be talking with you as we go through our day, that we might see you working, that we might know that your love is there and there and there and here, and to know that in those difficult moments, you're going to lead us through. You're going to provide some openings. You're going to open our hearts. You're going to provide some spark of wisdom, some illumination of love, so that moments that could be difficult are made to be miraculously wonderful because of your presence and our hearts open to you. Lord, sometimes it's just hard to know how to take that next step, but we know you're the one who's already made it. We just want to follow in your steps as, as we go along. And Lord, we trust you to lead and carry us. We present unto you, Lord, those whom we name before you today. In celebrations, Lord, increase the joy for birthdays, for anniversaries, for just one to say that today is a good day. Increase our joy. Multiply that happiness that comes into life when we feel the goodness just all around us. And present Lord, you be, we pray for those who are seeking to find their way through illness. Help Stan as she recovers at home. Be with Claire in her time in the hospital. Be with those who we have named that are struggling with ongoing treatment for cancer, that it may be that each of those steps, difficult though they are, will lead to healing, will lead to comfort, will lead to strength, and that those around them will get the fullness of support so that no one feels like they're struggling alone, but that each one knows there's a whole body of people standing around them to lift, to carry, and to just say, we love you, keep going, keep going. Thank you, Lord, when we see recovery happen. And thank you for Greg. We thank you for others in whom we, we see your recovery working because we know you're there and leading forward. And we pray for that to continue. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Help us to be your church as we meet together. Be there in the fullness of your spirit. Let us never be satisfied with what has been. Help us always be looking forward to what can be. Know that you are the one that provides the way, the strength, and the meaning for those things to be done. Lord, we trust you. And we just want to be a part of all that your spirit does in this world. That it may be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we pray in the name of Jesus. And we pray with the words of Jesus as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, our Lord be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, just as it's good to talk with God, so it is good to hear the Word of God speaking to us as we prepare our hearts to hear the scriptures of this morning. Uh, let us... Uh... The most repeated question by Jesus during his ministry was this. Have you never read? Have you never read? Underneath that simple question is a life-altering implication. You should read the Word of God. That's why Jesus also says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus knows that there is a spiritual hunger inside of every human heart that can only be satisfied by consuming the words of God. Christian, give yourself to the Word of God. The Word of God is a rock, strong and steady. It doesn't budge, break, or crumble under pressure. It's an anchor in the storm, keeping us calm when everything around us is chaotic. The Word of God is a mirror, showing us who we really are. You don't just read the Word of God, it reads you. It's a treasure, beautiful in every dimension and worth every effort of discovery. 
It brings endless joy and eternal riches to all who find it. It's a fire spreading across the world to bring heat and light. It's a river bringing life and power to everything it touches. The Word of God is a seed planted deep inside of our hearts, producing the fruit of holiness and righteousness. The Word of God is a sword dividing true and false, right and wrong, good and evil. It's a hammer crushing what needs to be crushed and breaking what needs to be broken. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to show us our path. So let the voice of God be the first, the last, and the loudest voice in your ear today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Give yourself to the Word of God. Scripture comes to us from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13 and 18, and chapter 4, 7 and 8. Who is wise in understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom, but if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But wisdom from above is first pure, then the wisdom from above is then peaceful, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts. You don't mind it. The gospel comes to us. Please stand. From Mark 9, 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another as to who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last and a servant of all. When he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Him is Lord who loves through humble service. As, uh, remain standing, we'll sing this together.
see if the exhaust fan is on. Seems like it's, oh, it's not. getting a bit stuffy in here. And um, I mean, it's it's uh, tough enough to sit through a sermon, but when the air gets stuffy, it makes it even tougher. <laughs> so, um, needing all the help that I can get, we could turn that fan on. That would be great. Sometimes you, you read the scripture, and incidentally, I love that introduction to the word. I mean, just the imperative of reading that word so that it can um, guide and direct us. The, um, the Hebrew word for word uh, means both the, uh, the word and it also means to obey. It's a, it's a thing that says, uh, read this word so that it can uh, do something to us. Um, but many times when I read the word, it's a, that's an interesting story. I just love that story about the Good Samaritan. Uh, it's tough to get its full meaning, but I get it. I love that story about that prodigal son. Ah, it's a great scene, that son coming back and being welcomed by his father. There's other times when you read the scripture and you say to yourself, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? You had that experience. Uh, and I often wish, you know, that in addition to the conference having a bishop, we, we would have a, an answer person, right? Some seminary professor so, or, or some sage somewhere that when that moment comes up, we would just uh, dial them up. Oh, no, that's the old-fashioned way of doing it, isn't it, to dial them up? We would text them with a question or email them with our inquiry and they would supply us with an answer. But it doesn't work that way, does it? You gotta figure it out for yourself. So help me figure out something this morning. Um, and, 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 and what I wanna try to figure out is, among other things, why the disciples, and this happens a lot, it doesn't just happen in this scripture that we read this morning out of um, uh, what gospel? Out of the Mark gospel. But again and again, the disciples, when they don't have anything else to do, start arguing about who is the greatest among them. Do you get that? Why would they be doing that? What would it, why would they want to know who is the greatest? Do they want to know who's next in command? So when Jesus steps down, they can take over? I don't think so. None of them are ready for that. Do they want to know who's the greatest so that they would get a jump up in the pay scale? I don't think so, because they were getting paid anyway. They had given up everything. Why were the disciples arguing with each other about who was the greatest? It's maybe human nature. That's a scary thought. That instead of following one who is the greatest, they're arguing among themselves who is the greatest. Well, and, and for some good reason, because there was evidence, there is clear evidence that Jesus did have those that he was working with most closely. I'm quite sure he wouldn't say they're the greatest, but they're the ones that he placed a lot of his hope in. Peter, James, and John, they were often with him in moments when the others were not quite as close, and maybe some others wanted to elbow themselves into that crowd. But my suspicion is that they were arguing among themselves about who was the greatest because that's what people do. That's what people did in, the, in their time, that's what people do in our time. And we know that Jesus was fed up with that kind of behavior, right? We know that in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, when Jesus talked about the religious leaders of his time, he talked about them in negative terms. Because they were the ones, he said, who always want to have the best seats in the synagogue. They were the ones who always wanted to be treated with the most respect. They were the ones who wanted to, when they went through the marketplace, wanted people to bow to them and call them rabbi. And then Jesus says, it's to be the opposite with you. So his disciples are falling into the trap. And our scripture from James warns about it, doesn't it? Of selfish ambition. I want to do this because it's what I want to do. I want to do this because it'll make me look good. 
I want to do this because people will honor me for it. I want to do this because with a little bit of luck, I've got a picture in the paper. I might even show up on the TV screen sometime. And Jesus says, all that is rubbish. He said that what is the greatest among us is the servant who is among us, right? Who is the servant among us. And Jesus sat down and started talking to his disciples about how they should really live their life. And what's interesting is he does this in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Each gospel has this moment in it. So it must be important. And each time Jesus does this, he calls a little child over to accompany him. I find this interesting because what that must mean is that little children are hanging around Jesus all the time. Yeah, because it says, Luke, Luke says, um, the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest, and Jesus says, not supposed to be that way among you. For instance, call, let me call this child over. Uh, 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 Simon, would you come over here and sit next to me? Jesus probably knows them all by name. You know, here call over her. Roberto, would you come over here and sit next to me? And Jesus then had a little child next to him. Do you know what he says? Do you remember what he said? When the little child was next to him? Whoever receives this little child receives me and the one who sent me. Whoever receives this little child is the key. Whoever is welcoming to a little child. Whoever welcomes this little child in. Now, a lot of translators of the scripture will, and if, by, by the way, if you can't call somebody or email somebody about what the scripture is about, there are commentaries. I mean, there are hundreds of them available, and you get all kinds of insights. And why do children? Why is Jesus calling children? Why do you think? Huh? For one reason, you call adults over, and he probably wouldn't come. <laughs> My little child said, oh yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. You know, I'll come right over. I would love it. The other is that children generally were disrespected. We know that because the disciples, who all too often represent the common culture of the time, when disciples, you remember that moment? There's a bunch of children who want to come over and gather close around Jesus, and what do they do? Get out of here. Master is busy. You don't have time for your little kids. Beat it. Oh, they play the role of a lot of us in our society, do they not? You know, it's, it's just kids. Get out of here. And so children represented those who were always kept at an arm's length. Get over there where you belong. Stay out of here because we don't want you here. Right? You're not as good as the rest of us. Maybe someday you will be, but you're not now. So just get out of here. And they represented all those disregarded, disrespected, dishonored, excluded people. And Jesus says, oh, why don't you come over here and sit next to me? And uses that as a moment of example. This is how we serve, he says. It starts with welcoming. We don't serve by saying, stay there, I'll send you some help. <laughs> it begins by saying, Come over here, sit next to me. We'll get this thing worked out between us, all right? But most significantly, it says, and I don't know why there weren't maybe 13, 14, or 15 disciples, and three of them were 10, 12, 13 year olds, eight year olds. They just followed Jesus wherever he went. They would be too rigorous for them, but wouldn't it have been neat if the, if the fifth one was named Billy? If the 13th disciple was named Johnny or Skip or Kiddo, yeah, it could well have been whoever welcomes this child welcomes me. What do you mean by that? Welcomes me? What do you mean by that? He welcomes the spirit of active love that Jesus is. If you welcome that child, you realize that this whole world is going to turn around with your welcoming. I think that's what he's saying. This whole world is going to turn around with your welcoming. And by the way, when Jesus welcomes the scene portrayed in Matthew, 
when Matthew portrays the scene, you know how it ends? With Jesus embracing the child. Make a big deal of it. Walk along with a big, a big hurrah. Fireworks if you need to. You know what I wish? You know, in, when, when I was growing up, there used to be spotlights that were sent out. And like when the, when the O'Donnell car dealership opened in my neighborhood on Frederick Avenue uh, in southwest Baltimore, they had these three big spotlights that set up in the sky. And you saw them, right? And the deal was to figure out where that light come from. <laughs> we were pretty bored in those days, right? And so we would look at that light in the sky, and you could trace it down. And we'd sit around and say, well, ah, I think it comes from that new snowball set. Nah, I got it. And you'd follow it out until you found out, oh, it's a car dealership. They said, well, Jesus says, make that big a deal about our welcoming of those who have never been welcomed before of those who have been isolated from us who are now a part of the community that we're forming. Let a spotlight go out so everybody knows something good special is happening there. Say, by the way, I am really hoping that that spire does that for us. I mean, we'll have to work it to make it happen that way. You've seen the, where is it? The truck's out there somewhere. It's in the parking lot where the lift is. And it's really neat to see those guys on that lift working on our spire. They're plugging up holes in it so it doesn't leak anymore and covering up all the old rusty screws and stuff that are there. And very carefully, you know, working. It's taken a long time. They take two more weeks to get the work done. Looks like this is going to be a good week to do it. I think they come back on Tuesday, right, Larry? And, um, and you'll see them up there working away. And I think that they're going to seal it all up. Then they're going to clean it. Then they're going to paint it. They wonder what color of white we want. <laughs> we want the brightest white you got. We want the light, and we want the white that'll glow in the sun and shine in the moon. Because we want everybody to know this is God's place. This is the place where you come and you get to feel welcome. This is the place where you come and you get respected, you get honored, you get you get all the love you could ever want. It's right here. This is a place that's set up by God to serve the community in such a way that everybody feels welcome, that everybody's needs are met. This is a place that if you're a child, you can come here and we embrace you. This is a place, oh, it goes on and on. But you get the feeling, right? And let the spire do that. When that spire work is finished, we're going to take a time in our service. And we're not going to uh, just sit here to do this, but we're going to... Oh, I hope it's a, it's a clear, sunny day like today. But we're going to go out, and we're going to look up, and we're going to see this fire. And we're all going to cast our hands up to it. And we're going to say, oh, Lord, may your presence be in that fire. And let it just come down and let your presence be in all our whole congregation so that we can be known as that welcoming place. You come in here. If you feel like there's nobody that really cares, you come in here. We care for you. If you feel like there's a struggle in your life and there's no strength for you, you come in here and we'll be that strength and that support for you. Or we will also say, from here, we're going to go out and we're going to help those who don't feel like they're getting help to get help. I was rejoicing the other night, and I know I'm stepping ahead of myself in this because we've got to take this to the council, but I think the council's going to go along with it. I was inspired by the finance committee the other night uh, when... when uh, when, uh, I'm not going to mention his name because um, he didn't want to be famous, but <laughs> we were, it was recommended to the finance committee that from now on, we take the earnings from one of our stock accounts, and it's a pretty good account, and we take the, those earnings that come in every year, not plow them back into our account, but to use those earnings to help the needs of others in the community. This can be as much as uh, two or three thousand dollars. And we'll have those to give gift certificates to help people with rents, to help people that are needing food, but most of all, to help people know there's somebody out there that cares that I'm in a tough time. Come all to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and it's us who can do that and will continue to do that. You know how faithful this congregation is to its need to serve the needs of others. We continue each week to bring those boxes of cereals. I'm impressed with the great variety of cereals that come to here. I mean, you always like to see more, but we're really good at that. 
We'll just settle for Cheerios. Oh, no, no, no. We go to Frosted Flakes and, and the Rice Krispies. And, and, and every week there's some to take from here over to Salem and say to the folks that gather on that parking lot on Tuesday mornings, there's people that care for you. There's people that love you. There's people that welcome you. Come and sit next to us and we'll work this thing out together, right? We'll find a way to get all We'll find a way to get everybody that's hungry fed. Jesus was up to something, though. It was more than just getting a box of cereal to somebody. Jesus was up to something. And the thing he was up to is forming community. What he wanted to do was to substitute that old hierarchical community where this guy is in charge and this person show is the best and everybody else has to measure up to that and replace that with a society that there's mutual respect and sharing for all. And he said, it begins with this. It begins when I welcome you. It begins when you welcome me. It begins when one person welcomes another. And put that at the center of your existence, my disciples, Jesus says, and he calls a little child over. Start with the children. Work well. Work all. Work out to all others who are neglected and call them to be a part of a community that will show the world how to live. That will move the world away from this endless arguing and bickering and move toward a cohesion of people that understand that we're not alien to each other. We're the brothers and sisters of each other beneath one father. And that we know how to get along enough to accomplish the goals that we have. And that is that each person be able to succeed and to find the best and the fullness of life. And you know what? It worked. Jesus worked it so that it worked. When it comes the time for his spirit to reign in Pentecost, the disciples knew how to do that welcoming. And in Jerusalem, there were people there from all over the world. And it was like the Olympics. It was like the spiritual Olympics. People were there from all over the world. And what happens is they all get welcomed into the community of Christ. And the community grew by thousands that day, it said. And then by the time you get to the fourth chapter of Acts, that community is sharing stuff with each other. And it's not just to say, well, like one person found out that there was so much need in the community, I better sell my house in order that I can use the outcome of that, the financial gain of that, in order to help everybody find a place to live. And it did. And, it's not, and it wasn't just for financial gain, but it was to say, there's not a person here that does not deserve our respect, that does not deserve the sharing of our resources because we are one humanity in Christ. St. Paul got the idea out of that after he had his conversion and he said, you know what? There's just one body. Oh, there's a lot of members of it. But there's just one body and each of those members cares for the other as preciously as they care for themselves. And that body set out to change the world. And it still does, because our world still needs changing. And so my friends, let us know that our identity as a church is deeply anchored in being welcoming. Now, I don't, I don't know how we need to translate that thing where Jesus says you gotta welcome a child, because there are no children in our church. Jeremiah is a teenager, no longer a child. <laughs> Jeremiah is now growing into manhood, a young man. Um, but we need to think about children. And you think about them in their literal terms, that is, those that are 12 and below. Or you think about them, who it is they represent? Who's out there that needs to find a community? Who's out there that needs to find a sense of belonging? Who's out there? that's struggling and needs to know the strength of a community that stands with them and enriches them every day. By the way, I ask and receive permission to take one of our kneelers. You know what kneelers are? If you ever was confirmed, sometimes you have a kneel or this little pad here in the pole chair, and you can kneel on that, and the um, pastor lays his hand on your head, and good things happen. Um, I ask permission to, uh, to use that uh, for our nephews. Kaya. Kaya has a very, very advanced form of, of, of rectal cancer. It makes it very hard for him to sit, but he sure can deal well. 
and I took it with him last night, and we had some crabs we were eating together. And there's Kai kneeling, putting your knee on to eat his crabs and having a great time. And by the way, I said, oh, since you're kneeling, Kai, you get to say grace to me. <laughs> and he was inspired to say just a terrific grace, but it meant so much, because he knows you. You know, and he said, ah, this is what the people gave me. Come sit next to me and be welcome, be supported. We, we can be that community. We are that community. We just need to let that light shine. So it's coming. Share with us in it. May the Lord's blessing be with us as we are the church and seek to become all that God needs us to be. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Let us pray. Lord, we can, we can just see your disciples standing in amazement when you have a child come and sit next to you and then you embrace it as a long lost and we pray that that inspiration to touch their hearts to become the community you wanted them to be may also touch our hearts to likewise continue to be, to grow to be, to succeed in being that community you call us to be in this place. Welcome and service for all. In Jesus' name. This morning we will use the affirmation of faith taken from the modern version. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will
that we have received, leaders that do lead, and we give our thanks and praise to God as we sing these words. Thank you. 